It's good to ask questions around certain aspects about uh, electronic communications and transactions, part and parcel of our everyday life nowadays, especially as for legal practitioners that use uh, electronic transactions and also communicate electronically with each other through service, um, etc. And also what this lecture mostly will entail is is uh, surrounding uh, contracts that is concluded between uh, practitioners and practitioners with clients and so forth. So basically that is the scope of, of, of this lecture. So yes, let's proceed. So you can see here, we're going to discuss the uh, ECT Act briefly, electronic signatures, internet and cloud technology, the responsibility for personal and commercial information. That specifically applies to a business, a practice. A practice is like a business where you deal with clients' information, you receive a brief from an attorney, you also have information that is in your possession. Many documents um, have identity numbers, addresses and so forth on that. So especially nowadays with uh, the advent of uh, electronics, much of the information is emailed, um, the court documents and so forth. So they, those in, that information must be protected. And then obviously the information regarding the emails that is used, that the, e the email also protects, uh, is protected so that there's no hacking of, of, of emails. That happens often where people are being uh, hacked or the emails are being hacked. So uh, that is very important as well in terms of protecting uh, commercial information. That is just another beyond that. Then we're quickly going to discuss blockchain and smart contracts. Many of you will know blockchain in terms of uh, cryptocurrency and uh, mostly because uh, Bitcoin the, and Ethereum and those um, cryptocurrencies that are currently being used. All right, the ECT Act, Electronic Transactions Communications Act. This act was only promulgated recently, you can see as in 2002, and then it has a vast effect on the electronic environment that we are in and the government thought it would be a good idea to actually promulgate such an act because of the, the, the communications that's on the internet that has been growing so vastly and um, more transactions are being done um, on the internet more sales are being done on the internet it's, it's, it, has, it has such a vast effect and, and, and my view is that if we didn't have this act, we might have had problems uh, with, with, with um, dealing with electronic communications, especially as legal practitioners where we serve documents under Rule 4A and also where the practice directives makes provision for, for serving under Rule 4A, especially um, if the parties have agreed to that or that or the court it makes instruction that the party should be served like that. Another um, method is where court grants a digital citation or through a uh, medium of fa um, Facebook by private messaging or WhatsApp private messaging, uh, whatever the case may be. And obviously the legalities that goes with that is protected under the ECT Act. So it, as you can see, this Act has become part and parcel of our everyday life uh, in, in transacting through the internet. And obviously there are, there are other um, statutes that also work with this, the Buyer Act, the protection of your personal information and, and, uh, and all that goes with that. So be mindful of that, go read up on the, the additional um, protection measures that are in place that obviously will apply uh, as, as I just mentioned. But more specifically, we must be cognizant of this Act um, for transactions. This slide just confirms what I've just said, that the ECT Act is the cornerstone of our information communication technology in South Africa on cyber law. Now, they use the, 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 words, the, the word cyber law, obviously, is the law that protects our the cyber interactions, our interactions, um, anything on the World Wide Web, especially uh, in relation to South Africa. Uh, later we'll discuss on uh, also the aspect of when a uh, contract is uh, concluded via um, data messaging, where and when the, the, the contract is concluded. So obviously you need a law that will make that type of specification and uh, 
So it's it is good that we have a co codification of, of uh, electronic communications or, or, or a means of cyber law uh, to uh, manage our transactions uh, through the internet. There there are many so many topics in terms of electronic communications, data messaging uh, that is covered in this one act. That's why it's called an omnibus act. And as you can see there at the bottom, it states that uh, chapters. Two of the ECT Act contains uh, the uh, e-strategy where uh, the previous disadvantaged communities need, needed to be included uh, in communications. Nowadays, you'll see many people walking around with these smartphones. Although many smartphones are expensive, you have a range of smartphones that actually can um, provide basic um, communication tools on the phones because many of those tools are already included. Um, on the phone when the phone is purchased a uh, business and also the, the 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 downside with the smartphones it often contains um, uh, apps where the people are transacting through so that's why i'm mentioning smartphones specifically i thought i'll just mention it here as well because it's important to the e-strategy is good and everybody's starting to have communications but it's not just on the smartphones it's also actually having uh, say wi-fi for instance at your uh, place many of you are using your, your facilities at home or wherever you are staying uh, through your Wi-Fi to, to, to actually um, um, listen to this lecture today. And others would obviously use their smartphones or tablets uh, to, 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 um, be com to communicate or, or, or view this lecture of, uh, over the internet. So there are so many methods of how the connectivity for everybody is there. So it's not just about the disadvantage. I think uh, the e-strategy must probably have worked because, as I already indicated, many people already um, have access to the internet. The problem, however, is uh, I think communities where you have pure, poor people that are struggling to have access to the internet in schools, for instance, for children, where they can be um, educated on the use of uh, electronic. So the, the, the government has tried to uh, roll out systems with, with computers. I don't know what the success rate are there, but I've also seen many news uh, releases where schools have been uh, robbed of these um, uh, computers that, that, that have been uh, placed at this, uh, some of these schools. So we, although many people have access to, uh, to internet, many are still uh, need to be educated or uh, be uh, able to access such information. All right. Uh, I already said that the uh, ECT Act also applies to Rule uh, 4A, where uh, service is being done, and specifically under Sections 23 and 26 of, of the ECT Act. This is, the, this is an important aspect of, of um, this ECT Act and how it uh, relates to drafting of contracts. Firstly, we discuss, there are four aspects and we're firstly going to discuss the email and also data messages. So obviously parties, we all are known and used to the, uh, when cell phones came out that we were texting each other. There was no WhatsApp and Facebook and so forth, especially those of us that are a bit older when phones came out in the 90s. I remember my first phone was a brick phone and it was really the size of a brick. So we mostly only phoned and was able to send text messages to each other. We also paid a lot of money to send uh, text messages. Now we can send, send um, emails via phone or through our computers and emails did exist at the time when uh, the phones came out. If I remember correctly, emails, we were able to send emails and have uh, well, had access to internet in the 80s and then we used emails now you can send emails through your phone as well and obviously you even have systems that you can send messages via the computer so this is the communication one of the communication mediums that are available now i must have, uh, mention at this stage also that with data messages and emails and i'll might elaborate a little bit more on it just now is that information are exchanged and there's case law where people were sued over um, information that was exchanged. Uh, there, there are some couple of cases where 
people made derogatory um, con uh, uh, comments and they were taken to court. It is a communication medium and, it's, and it is covered under the um, ECT Act. So obviously because it, uh, the, the ECT Act under um, sections 11 and 22 so stipulates that um, anything that is done over the, uh, um, through, through this medium is enforceable by law. And that's why specifically um, same will apply to contracts. And uh, so where the parties contract through through um, email or through messaging, then that is enforceable. So this is very important that uh, we need to understand that you can't make a communication and uh, don't think that there will, won't be any repercussions. Because especially if you made a commitment or you made an agreement through this electronic communication, you will be bound by it. it the contract will be enforceable. Another thing that I need to also explain here is where, but when a contract is concluded, a person will send an offer and then the, uh, the, off, the, the person that received the offer um, need either reject or accept the offer and then they send the offer back to the person that um, has sent the offer. The offer. Why I'm mentioning this? Because the course of action obviously is important here where the contract was concluded. The contract is concluded where the uh, offerer is receiving the, 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 the actual um, offer that was um, accepted. You will remember from your LLB studies, it's different when somebody receives a document through the post. Where it is received, that is where a, a, a contract will be concluded. So this is one of the areas where the ECT Act is slightly different when a contract is concluded through either email or through a message. Where it's received, that is where the uh, agreement or contract was con uh, concluded. So this is a very important aspect that you must remember. The ECT Act says where the offer was accepted, that is where um, it is uh, uh, not accepted, where it was received from, from the offerer. That is where um, basically it will apply. I'm going to use an example. A stays in Pretoria. B stays in Bloemfontein. A sends the, 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 the agreement to B in, in Bloemfontein. B looks at the agreement, B accepts it and returns the uh, signed agreement to um, A in Pretoria. So. A, it, because he stays in Pretoria and, and also where his um, um, offices are, then the contract is concluded in Pretoria, which is by A. And, and, and what I was saying earlier, it, it's different when some um, when an agreement or something is sent through the post. It will be it would have been in Bloemfontein, but in this in this scenario, and I don't want to confuse you because you must understand the difference between um, where, where the document was sent. Yet was sent electronically, it wasn't sent physically. And because it was sent electronically, it is construed as a data message. And that data message then basically um, is, is received back by the offerer, which is A. And A basically, that is where the course of action took place. So what happens, you sign a, a contract with, with the employer that they will, um, you know, they, you'll have benefits and so forth. Uh, that will go with that. They might not say what the benefits are, but remember when the when the company provides you with the tools to do your work, they they are entitled to to actually um, access um, that inf uh, phone because remember that phone belongs to the company, and for you to use that company that company phone for uh, personal conversation, it it's dangerous. And let's be honest, it happens often that uh, people are doing that. So what I did is when I worked for one company, I actually took their cell phone SIM card and I put it in my phone because I had a, a phone with a dual SIM. So I um, separated the private from the work. So I didn't do phone calls um, in the private nature on the phone. So the, the, the company, company, it is their tools. They entitled to access their tools and also um, it comes back to the aspect where the, 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 the point of trust is, um, comes in because I know it, it might be debatable. I don't know the commissioners might might argue on uh, might have some insight on this. But my view is this that that phone belongs to the company. The company has a right to access 
um, that uh, um, uh, to uh, to the information on that phone. They might even record on that phone. They might even force you to record on that phone because they they the information that's communicated on that phone is because of the business transactions that um, is happening between you as a representative of the company and a prospective client or somebody else. So that, that is my view in short on, on that. So I don't know if the commissioners might have a view on that as well, but this is where the, uh, also your right of privacy, um, should I say, um, is negligible in terms of the fact that this is the company's phone. But if it was on your phone, um, and they access your phone without your permission, then obviously there's a problem with um, access to the right of privacy, but obvi obviously they also need to be authorized to have access to your personal phone. So that is where I will draw this, this distinction because that's why I was very aware of that aspect when I worked for companies. So obviously the company might not trust uh, a person when they um, suspect something is happening as well. So in essence, it just sounds that if you use a company's uh, phone that was given to you, be careful because any agreements that you um, transact or, or whatever, especially uh, uh, will be will be considered as a contract. I'll give you an example. It comes to uh, we a person works for a company. Now this also relates to corporate law, and also um, this is very important. There are case law where contracts were concluded where a person was about to leave the company and, the, and it was, uh, uh, they, so they were still employed with the original company and then they benefit after the fact and they established their own company or worked for another company. So they benefited out of that. Those people lost all their cases because um, they were actually uh, uh, unlawfully um, benefiting. So they had to pay uh, all that monies to the company that they worked for. Similarly, if you conclude a contract via the phone um, for your personal gain, that contract will be uh, um, legal and binding and it will be enforceable. Now it sounds weird what I'm saying, but because the contract is, is legal and binding uh, that a person has concluded with the other party while using that phone. Similarly, when the uh, the company has actually um, have access to that information. They can also um, they have the right to to, to access um, that communications and they can sue accordingly because that, that will be their proof it's because there was a contract directly concluded on the uh, under the ECT Act. So we're getting in a bit of te technicalities here, but this is just to indicate you how good the ECT Act is but how dangerous it can be, be for, for, for the people that um, are utilizing um, the, the uh, um, technology to, to actually conclude um, any transactions. Two case law, Jafta versus KZN in Wildlife, where um, the, some of you might even know this case, uh, especially the commissioners, where the person accepted employment via um, SMS. Um, KZ in Wildlife, I actually read the case a while back, said no, we, because there were communications between one person at KZN and, and Yafta, and eventually Yafta uh, actually accepted the offer. And then the court held it, it is a valid contract. So this is a very good example of what I've just um, said, that whatever you do over the um, over the phone, whether by SMS or you send an email from your phone and it's accepted by the other party, it's valid contract under Section 11 and 22 of the ECT Act. It's offer and acceptance. It's a contract. You, so, um, and if you are on the wrong end of, of such an agreement, be sure that you are um, going to bear the brunt of, 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 of um, this act. All right, another case here, Mafika versus ACABC, the Labour Court held that the resignation by um, SMS was also legally binding um, because it was, there was doulos, there was intent, the person wanted to, to resign. So I think in this, if I remember this case, I might be wrong, Mafika said that his uh, uh, resignation, uh, um, uh, he, didn't res he didn't actually resign but in the court held that um, he actually did resign. I might be wrong, but I know it was something to that effect where there were argument on the uh, resignation between the parties. Then contracting via the 
World Wide Web. Now, here we use an example where a person wants to buy something or want a, con uh, a contract. Now, um, we're using a mail order system, but it's similar to when some of you actually applied to, to um, at Legally Law to study uh, your um, legal practice training with us. So you filled out the document, we send you information and there was acceptance and you've ticked on some buttons and then we confirmed your registration. In this type of scenario with mail order systems, they actually, you, you select, you fill out and then it will take you to a payment screen and that you will and then you will pay. Many of them allow you to actually do EFTs um, after the order and once the EFT has actually been um, received by them, then they will release um, the order as paid. Uh, I said I put there at the bottom where most of these services require immediate payment for the online transaction. Yes, um, but nowadays because Many people uh, don't have credit cards or uh, the appropriate um, payment mechanisms available for to themselves. Uh, rather, they can elect to do an EFT. So many of these um, institutions like PayFast and so forth, they actually have an EFT function so you can pay through your debit card uh, or, your, uh, or your, uh, you can pay in that manner. And then you just put in all your passphrases and security uh, codes and what have you, and then you can do the um, transaction. They, obviously, that will mostly work with um, your bank with a uh, two-factor authentication. You send, uh, put in an OTP that's sent to you and so forth. Many of you know this um, method of, of, of um, purchasing. I believe many of you have purchased online or have done transactions online. So I, I believe many of you are familiar with this um, type of these type of transactions. Uh, but what's important here is that when you uh, tick accept or so forth uh, and and that type of thing on the on that website and it is specifically stated where you accept that you uh, agree with the uh, terms and conditions then it's a contract because then it becomes binding because you've elected you've selected uh, um, that you've paid and conversely the the, the party that has to uh, or the, the service provider that must supply you with the goods or the items or the service or ebook whatever you've purchased they are also bound by the by that contract so it's it's a two-way um, um, street here uh, another thing that's very important is it must also be kept in mind that when you deal with uh, online purchasing like this or contracting uh, go and check uh, reviews on on, on these uh, companies that provide services on the on the wide web. You can even buy examples of contracts on, on the web and so forth, or some uh, legal practitioner, there are legal practitioners that sell services on the web and then you will then you will tell them how much it's worth to you and then you'll pay them and they'll give you 10 or 15 minutes for, I don't know, 100 bucks or something like that. But go and check the reviews on the site, see if those people will actually um, supply you the goods. Why am I saying this? In South Africa, if you buy online, you can actually sue somebody easily. The moment you buy uh, from uh, 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 on the web, and that those people, uh, those suppliers outside South Africa, you buy on Amazon or whatever, you've got a problem because unless there is some sort of agreement, uh, 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 trade agreement, you've got no chance of, of getting your money back. If they are honorable and they will re, uh, refund you, there are some companies that does an international trade um, uh, through the uh, web. They will refund you if you don't receive um, whatever you're supposed to. Uh, but unfortunately, many, 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 and I'm saying it again, many companies are not honorable. They will not refund your money because now your rent is converted to dollars and you paid a lot of money and you're not getting whatever you bought. Be careful of that. Uh, that's why. This is a, this is the contracting that is binding, but if it's outside South Africa's jurisdiction, you might have a problem to actually transact or uh, get your money back. So always make sure that if you deal with a foreign um, institution, that they have a base in South Africa that you um, 
can actually sue them if, if something goes wrong in terms of the contract or they don't perform in, in terms of the agreement. So that is very important, jurisdiction. Uh, uh, some of these contracting companies on the white might even put on the, on the on, in the terms and, uh, agreement that the jurisdiction way will be their jurisdiction. Be mindful of that because the moment that you're on their jurisdiction, you, 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 you've got a good chance of losing your um, money when you pay. I'm mentioning this because you're going to deal with clients. They're going to um, do online um, purchasing and contracting and they're going to run into these type of problems. And then you can advise them, tell them, be careful. All right. And that will also give an indication whether the, the client has, has a case or not. Because you uh, you can try contact the, whoever supplied your client, um, supposed to supply your con uh, client with some goods that they were purchased, or ask them for a refund, and hopefully they'll refund. So um, this is very important because it seems like a small thing, but uh, contracting via the, the web has become uh, a, a, a place for all these scammers that request you to pay money and so on. People are getting scammed through through the web. So we've seen it a lot where people will ask to pay money for some things and so on. I'm now a little bit off the topic, but all these all these aspects interact because the web is is, is a tool for many people to get money, either um, in, the, in a good sense or in others where people just want to scam others um, uh, from the money. ED, EDI agreements, electronic data interchange, uh, that's where computers communicate with each other. I mean, when you work with ser uh, on servers, you will find corporates using this type of system. So they have a network and the, the net, uh, on the network, the, the, the departments can actually uh, invoice between each other or they have you can they can also have a system where people can purchase from them coming back to the uh, uh, online system and then they will issue invoices or shipping um, notes between them inventory documents here yeah, it's also it comes in where um, stock was moved between the, the the branches for for clients and and so forth and also that we get nowadays, you might order a book from, I ordered a book the other day from, from a company. So what they did is um, they, they would send it maybe perhaps through a third party. And, and that is where this type of agreement also comes in. So I've, I've purchased online. They obviously have a supplier that they interlink with and we're all interlinked through this agreement system because we, we've we basically concluded an agreement by um, myself buying a, a, a book from them and paying them so they have to actually um, uh, supply me the book which they did uh, through the delivery. So obviously they've, they interact with um, their supplier again, especially if they're an intermediary, which was the case here. Handout devices or cellular phones. All right, now here yeah, we get Samsung Pay and and all those type of uh, uh, smartphone companies that are starting to have their own um, payment systems, or you just tap your 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 phone, you hold it over the the device, um, because it uses a, a scanner to uh, code, and and then you pay obviously. Then also you get little devices that you can attach to cell phones, that you can uh, use. Uh, to do a, a transaction with the debit or credit card. I, I see it a lot, uh, especially where they are small business and they don't uh, have uh, other means of, of receiving the funds or they want immediate uh, receipt of the funds, especially if they do um, off-site off uh, services and then that type of um, what you call it service is used. Now the USSD, we see it often where uh, people will buy data so that's also where you buy data for your phone or um, or some extra airtime. Then you, you you will send um, the information through the USSD code, and then it will actually um, you will pay, or if you've got credit, and then it will actually supply with data and so forth. So there are so many interactive mechanisms that are being used. Now you can see we've spoken about emails and data messages, and now we're talking about MS, uh, USSD codes. We deal with that, those type of codes basically every day. 
where um, transactions also take place. And obviously then, as I was indicated, through mobile devices, tapping with device, um, like Samsung Pay and so forth. The more we talk, the more you can see that there are so many issues with when it comes to um, uh, e-commerce and electronic, electronic communications and, and, and how wary we must be and mindful we must be and, dil and, and, and um, diligent because there are so many ways that we can do transactions and obviously there are scammers that um, will utilize these mechanisms or systems not for good but for their own benefit but also you also need to understand that these services also are beneficial and and how they will actually assist you in your practice so we are discussing the positives and the negatives because it's important every every with every positive there is the possible negative and that is where the negative can actually come in like we had just now with the right of privacy and protecting people's information and even in your client's information that we'll get to just now that is very important great okay electronic signatures so protective uh, risk management strategy now yeah, we just got some benefits that it's fast, it's secure, and look here, secure, assuming you keep your password safe. Now, there are people that can track passwords when they are typing on computers, especially if computers are hacked or they're on the, on, on, on the, on, on the system. Uh, maybe a company like we've just discussed earlier, where they uh, uh, computers are interlinked and you get somebody that's clever they can hack other people's passwords and so forth uh, and I deal with apps so apps are they when they, you log into your um, bank you actually click with your mouse you don't type now I don't know if many of you know this but a mouse click cannot be picked up by a hacker but a keystroke can be picked up all right and this is why I, I I like that system where you actually click your your inform, your uh, account number in and also your 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 pass your password which is a um, combination a password you actually tick it from uh, put it in from a keyboard that they supply you on screen. So unfortunately, not everybody has that. Other um, and then some um, other bank we I deal with with Capitec. They obviously have where you have a separate um, approval that you have to do. Apps also have where you make a payment, you must approve the payment from, from your phone, uh, that type of thing. Um, similarly, we need to also make sure when we deal with um, information on our computers that uh, our computers will lock or we set it up that it locks after a um, certain time of in inactivity, because that's important that we um, think about these issues regarding um, passwords and information that we'll have on our computers that we have to protect. Now, I'm not going to be happy if I deal with, with you and then you, you tell me now about my information, your computer has been hacked or my information has disappeared with your computer. I'm not, I'll, I'll definitely not be happy. All right. And also a very important aspect, do not share passwords uh, with others, I'm not talking about your in your personal capacity, but I'm talking about especially when you um, have your practice. Now, some of you might have an assistant working for you eventually, or you have now, or you might have uh, people working for you. Only the people that entitled to have passwords for whatever um, access they require and for whatever um, software or system they work on. That is the passwords they should have. And obviously, the appropriate people that need to have access to those passwords um, should be reliable people. And that's obviously um, also important so that information is not left out. And then authentication, I've just explained also about the authentication software that the banks use. Um, so that is that is very uh, um, good, but it should also be important that if you can in your system to have maybe some sort of authentication software or at least have um, your system 
password protected. I've had an issue with my um, software that I use for my practice, and the, uh, um, we've actually taken it up with the, the, the company that gives us um, this, the platform. We the system doesn't lock off automatically if there's inactivity. So those are the type of um, dangers that you have to address and um, be, be mindful of because somebody else can access um, information of people that are private and confidential. All right. Great. Now, risks of electronic signatures. Now, we know that Many people's uh, and uh, signatures can get uh, forged on on paper uh, through identity theft and and so forth. But with electronic signatures, we need to have two uh, two factor authentication. Now, electronic signature. Let's go back to the banking, where you actually do a purchase and you receive. Uh, you put in your passwords and all that, and then it also sends you, uh, uh, the bank sends you an OTP, and that OTP you must also enter onto the onto the system. Um, so, that is a type of, of, of um, aspect that's important to make sure there's no forgery or, or, now I'm using the word as forgery because it's electronic signature for somebody to use somebody's uh, to sign on somebody's behalf on even on a computer that is obviously forgery because you managed to get a um, hold of information on how to sign that document so in my view it's forgery so you're using somebody's information um, uh, to sign it's as if you're signing um, with 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 their signature all right fraud obviously what we do have seen before where people's um, cell phone details are getting stolen and, and so forth, uh, so they're being defrauded of their money, especially in banks. And similarly, it can happen where um, an email is hacked and then, then the, uh, we will have in a situation where somebody is defrauded of, of, of funds. Good example, I think I mentioned it in an earlier lecture, maybe this year, is where there were attorneys that were defrauded through an email where of I think 1.7 million rand and where the, the, the banking details of, of the so-called person is supposed to receive the payment for, for the transaction. The banking details so-called changed, the attorneys paid on that and they didn't verify. So that is a type of fraud that can happen with um, with these type of transactions. And that's where the risk management tra strategy comes in because you have must have procedures in place in where um, the information must be verified <clears throat> to prevent any fraud from taking place. So lovely to have emails, but it can also be a problem. Uh, now, how does the electronic signature come in this? I mean, when the a person's name is written underneath it. It is accepted that it's either who is supposed to be the client, for instance, that's supposed to get the the the, the, um, the funds, and then the attorneys well thought it was their information and everything looked correct. However, I want to also mention that when you look at an email and you receive an un, in, unknown email, you can actually. Uh, sometimes you can uh, hover over the email address, especially if the email address has been changed, but in the background will actually show where the email is coming from. Uh, that also um, happens that there are some clever scammers out there that know how to hide the um, email uh, address. And specifically when you deal with clients' money, and I'm a trust account advocate, I ask the client to actually send me uh, a bank confirmation letter and I also phone the client because how can you not confirm with the client that the details and also ask him to send the bank confirmation letter because the moment somebody sends a bank confirmation letter like that and 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 uh, then you would understand um, that it is their account or not great now Electronic signatures cannot use, be used to sign um, or execute wills or sign codicils and uh, 
alienation of immovable property, bills of exchange, and so forth, and long-term agreements older than 10 years. Those documents has, have to be physically signed in the presence of the attorney or the parties and so forth. Those are specifically excluded in terms of the ECT Act. So there we still back to basics where we actually physically have to sign the documents. I'm not going to take a break because I wouldn't be, I'm not going to be too long on this aspect anymore. Uh, just a, are there any questions at this stage so far of, of what I've said? The whole idea with, with transacting in this manner also um, um, affects the fact of, of, of the information that you have to protect of the, peop of the people um, that you deal with and that you have in your, uh, in, in your possession. I've, I think I've mentioned earlier in this lecture as well that the risk management, and this comes in here with this risk management, is where you have to mitigate the risks of information that you have in your position and that it comes out. My question is this, how did, in that case, how did that information come to the other party? I mean, was it somebody at the attorney's firm that uh, spoke, uh, spoke about it or somebody had access to the information and then actually divulged that information and that's where they were defrauded? You see, so, and that's where the risk management comes in because there must be procedures in place in, in, in a firm, in your practice, even if you practice by, um, as, as, a, as a referral advocate, you're going to have information. I mentioned this earlier, that information must be protected. And you must, and if something goes wrong and where that person um, is suing you because your informa the information is getting uh, got out, then you must be absolutely sure that information didn't come from you. Maybe it was hacked when the attorney sent you the information um, by email, for instance, because it is it's a it's a real fact that it, uh, emails, for instance, gets hacked, and that's why my emails runs over SSL TLS. Um, I've set it up like that so that my emails doesn't get hacked. And that is the other thing that we must understand because I run through um, a point of presence and then uh, with TLS SSL. Now, now I'm telling some of you something interesting about this because this is the other thing that is important. So I'm from my side, I'm trying to make sure that even my emails are not being tampered with and not compromised. And similarly, any other information that is in your practice or with an attorney, or if you're a trust account advocate and, and because your business grows bigger, you sit with a lot of information and files. All my files and information are here in my office. My office has got a security gate in the front and, and so forth, and there are alarms and stuff. But apart from that, even my computer is protected and um, the information that I deal with. So the Poppy Act definitely, definitely is very important. And I, and I mentioned earlier in, in, in this lecture as well, Anything that relates to the ECT Act, um, and now that you've mentioned the Poppy Act and the protection of personal information, I mentioned, I actually briefly spoke about it earlier, is, is of paramount importance. So don't take the ECT Act in isolation. Any way that the ECT Act applies, and, and especially with personal information, is very important. Because let's think about it when you contract, the, the, the contract is personal to you or your company, all right? But that information still needs to be protected. The whole world doesn't need to know about your your, your transaction that you are doing or, or that's taking place, especially um, when you deal uh, with with um, transactions that in, is, um, uh, involves money and so forth. And then obviously the the personal information that on documents. I I'll give you another example how I also protect information. Any document that I've printed that I'm not using that I that I need to discard. I actually, I've bought a shredder and I'm shredding in that document. So um, I'm, I've, I've bought one of those shredders that actually rips it in a, thousands of pieces so that nobody can put it together and actually get the information like you've seen in the movies. So this is this is the type of protection that, that, that I believe should be there. So I'm always thinking, how am I going to protect the information of my client? How am I going to protect it in, um, that I uh, on my computer, I'm going to protect my emails. And and yes, the other thing that we never think about, that's not even in the, uh, that is not even part of this. When you speak to client uh, to people about clients, that's also a form of protection because that's also part of the protection of the information of your clients. 
I'm not talking about talking um, uh, basic information, but information that can be detrimental to your client's case or to anybody or have an effect on a, on a person, um, status of a person, whatever, that must be protected. Now you can see in uh, yes, uh, description of what is an e-signature uh, e or electronic signature. Here we say the traditional wet ink signature. Now electronic uh, wet ink signature can be uh, done, then it's um, scanned and then it is applied to a document. So that actually then becomes an electronic signature. Even if you type your name on, on the document on, at the bottom of the email, that is a signature. Yeah, you can see where I'm talking about, I accept tick box on the website. That is a signature because you're saying I'm accepting because you actually tick in the box. But if there's no tick, I'm of the view then you haven't accepted. But because you proceeded on the on, on the transaction and you've and you've actually uh, performed on the transaction and you've paid, then you've actually concluded the transaction because you had intent. The moment that you've paid, you've you've got intent. So don't think that you must just click accept. The moment one of the parties have performed, like you've paid on on or uh, the party has paid, then they actually bound by that agreement. Um, because they have performed. If they didn't pay, they, they transacted, they didn't pay, then they actually really haven't, in my view, accepted. But that's debatable in court or, um, yeah. But the moment some a party has performed, then other party must perform. Because the moment that I've made an offer, you perform, then we actually add item. It's like buying a bread. I put the bread on the counter, you give me 10 rand for the bread, I take the 10 rand, you take the bread, we've concluded an agreement. And often people don't realize it. We, conclude um, so many informal agreements. Even if we just give somebody something for nothing, that's an agreement because we've agreed, I'll give you this this suite. You don't have to pay me for this suite. Or I've given you a, a brush. You don't have to pay me. That's an agreement. Similarly, it, it applies that if somebody says they'll send you something for free and on the internet and you 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 requested it and I send it, that's an agreement. E-pins, the banks, they love using e-pins or a finger. Sometimes the e-pin doesn't work, then I'll use my, my fingernail to sign on the tablet. Then you have software products that you, I mean, even PDF documents, you you can use your e-signature and actually can draw it in there, and then you can sign within that uh, software. So there are so many uh, ways that people are signing, even um, with e-documents or uh, EduSign, oh, yeah, is, what's it, doc, doc, DocuSign or something like that. That's also available now. Yeah, I was talking about the software that are available that can digitally sign documents. Like your, like I mentioned, the PDF, just pull in the, the signature and then it actually places it on the document. What I often do is if I sign a PDF for, um, when I apply for an account at the bank, for instance, then I use my electronic signatures and um, I just duplicate it, or if I do an online uh, contract that I have to send to somebody digitally, then in the footer we have to initial, I put in my actual full um, signature because I, I haven't got a, 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 a initial um, signature. I just have a full signature, excuse me, and then I will do it at the bottom, and then I'll actually sign where I need to sign the document. I've concluded many uh, documents where I've done it with e-signature. I believe many of you have also done that and also in different forms. Yes, yes, a, 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 a graph of what a, a electronic signature is, especially the one um, that is protected. So obviously um, there's a private key, a public key is accessible to the person wishing to authenticate the person's private key. So yeah, this person creates the private key and then it sends uh, the key to the person on the other side and tell them that they can access that, um, the document. So it's an authorization for a third party or another party to access your information through the public key that you've provided. So similarly, you'll have contracts or information that uh, somebody needs to um, access where this uh, system is um, provided. You've got information that's somewhere and then you actually can give somebody the key, uh, a code that they can access um, to view it. Effect of business or the legal practice through the use of internet or cloud technology. I think I've already discussed the issue of um, internet 
What's, what's good about the internet is that now because it's available, you can access, because we've got the, ad, the internet, it's so easy to, to get information from the internet, do transactions through the internet, and also it costs you nothing. All, well, not really nothing. All it costs you is your data that you use to access the internet. And it makes you more productive as a practitioner because you will have access to information much more readily and also, it will be cost effective in the sense that sometimes you don't have the resources to buy books or whatever have you, you can actually access the information online. You can actually get cases online and what have you, investigate and so forth. Yes, unfortunately also there are some suppliers out there that request you to pay them for information, but that is your prerogative whether you want to use that or not. Good example, Lexus, Nexus, Juta and so forth, especially for legal practitioners. The point remains, it is much cheaper nowadays to use the internet than maybe um, physical resources like your books. Uh, you can buy ebooks cheaper than buying the physical book and then you have access to that. So the internet um, is a good tool to, to use and you all use it because here you are listening to this lecture. Great. Emails, I'm not going to go into emails again. Emails are straightforward. You do your correspondence, you communicate. You save time in, in writing letters, sending message, messengers and all that. I don't really serve um, uh, um, email, uh, clients with, well, the op opposing parties with uh, email service unless I have to. Uh, recently I served somebody in the UK. Now we've got a nice dispute over that service. But that's the only time really that I will serve somebody um, via email. Other than that, I just use the email for general correspondence between myself, clients, and opposing parties, and so forth. The I call practice directives obviously also makes provision for um, service under Rule 4A via email. Because the Rule 4A provides, after the initial um, documents have been served by the sheriff, then subsequent to that, uh, electronic service may be done. However, the opposing, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the parties may elect not to be served via email. They might have the reasons. Now, if you go and read at the ECT Act, it will stipulate, I think it's under section 23. I might be wrong, but in any case, the ECT Act says that when the document has been received by the, um, by the receiver's um, ser uh, server, then it's constituted as um, um, delivered. But in my view, it doesn't mean because it's delivered, I've received it. Because there, there's sufficient case law when when, uh, when a summons has been left by the sheriff on the grass or something, and it doesn't come hasn't come under the attention of the actual person, then and then um, then that person hasn't been served properly. So likewise, in this scenario, the same would apply. So that is the danger of the Rule 4A. If you serve under Rule 4A. All your subsequent documents uh, to, uh, to the initial one that was served by the sheriff and the party has not um, uh, accepted that service but he uh, or she has confirmed receipt of the document all right that is under rule uh, under section 26 of the ect act the it will be considered as received if the if the uh, if there's a way that either the the the, the um, uh, it is acknowledged um, by the um, server or by the person itself. So that's the method. So the person has acknowledged um, or sent a read, read, read receipt, then that person has basically um, confirmed receipt of the document. Any time that I believe that a person can be so, uh, forced to uh, accept service under Rule 4A is if they consent or that the court orders them that they will uh, they have to receive um, service um, via f under rule 4a so this is this this is something that i haven't seen the courts debate about too much but what the court did the uh, um, rule on was the fact the moment that the person has come away or or has acknowledged received i have case law where judge um Lamont in Johannesburg, he ruled on that and some of his and some other judges that when a person acknowledges that they've received the documents, then they have received it, then the rules will further not apply in terms of 
service because the person acknowledged receipt, irrespective of what the argument uh, is. Personal commercial information, I think we we spoke about that briefly just now when the question arose on, on the Poppy Act and that there must be risk management uh, protocols in place. That is very important that, um, especially if you have staff working for yourself, uh, for you in your practice, depending on the size of your practice, that you have some uh, risk management protocols in place. When you become a trust account advocate and you do the PMT course, they actually give you lectures on risk management and you have to uh, compile a risk management uh, document. And similarly, the same will apply to your, uh, to your practice. And even when you uh, answer questions on your or provide information on your practice for your fidelity fund certificate, they, they request that you have these um, procedures in place. Uh, and they also ask you, the auditors, what uh, protocols you have in place and so forth, especially because you're dealing with uh, personal information, you're dealing with commercial information of, of clients, you hold money and the commercial side of things is the funds that you hold in trust of the clients. Every month you have to sign off that your uh, uh, funds in the trust account is being checked and that it corresponds with the, the funds in the trust account uh, and, and, and your books. So it is, it is of utmost importance that you mitigate the risk in, in the practice. And as you can also see, it's very important that you train the personnel on that risk um, associated in, uh, in, in, the, in the practice. Especially with the, uh, the people that deal with clients, um, information, and let's be honest, any person that works with you mostly will deal with uh, clients' information and, and the person that de deals with the books of the company or the in, of your practice or the in institution, they, that person also obviously has to um, understand the risks and the, the, the man risk management factors that has to be considered when they're dealing with a, a client's information. So this is a very important aspect that you have uh, risk management uh, protocols in place. Also, we spoke earlier about computers and devices that have sensitive information that are also password protected um, and also must only be ex um, accessible to authorized personnel. You're going to have the, uh, what you call it, somebody that does the filing have access to the computers if that person is working in the filing room or just does copies, but that person still has access to information because they have they make copies. So obviously that come uh, what comes into play here is the um, um, destruction of, of uh, documents that is no more or no longer needed. Um, documents must be kept in the practice if, I, uh, if I'm correct, uh, five years at least, and when those documents are no longer required, then they must be destroyed, uh, either through fire or ripped apart or shredded, whatever. Uh, but that is some of the uh, risk management protocols that must be in place, even for that person that is just doing copies or filing or uh, has to destroy some documents. And obviously, that person must understand uh, the risks of uh, destroying the incorrect documents or not destroying documents that is thrown into a dustbin in, uh, in, uh, outside and somebody actually gets hold of that information. Our last item is blockchain. In short, you can see blockchain um, is a database that is shared across the network of computers. Now, the blockchain that we know, for instance, now is the, the Bitcoin, that which is a cryptocurrency where the, inform the information is on, on, on this, on, in the database. Nobody has ex access to that information, obviously, apart from the people that manage the, the actual database. But obviously, those type of databases are so heavily protected, you don't usually know where they are. And the people that work in those, uh, in those centers where those databases are kept under, uh, under such strict um, scrutiny and rules and protection and uh, those people can't even have criminal records because they have to protect this information and the integrity of this data on these databases. Now, the downside of this blockchain uh, where the people can't change it is, I've read now on, uh, on numerous occasions where people have lost their Bitcoin. One person specifically actually 
uh, had the, the bit the the coding on his on what I, from what I understand on his computer or his laptop or something, and then he, he accidentally threw it away and his money is gone because you need that code from my understanding. I'm not dealing in, in uh, um, cryptocurrency, but that is the type of problem that can happen with 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 blockchain. The information is so secure that uh, it's difficult to just get that information again. And because in the, in with Bitcoin, you don't really know who the buyers of the Bitcoin are or the holders of the Bitcoin are. It's difficult for them to say, all right, but I've lost. Um, yes, my I don't know what my code is because there's no name linked to the Bitcoin. It's just the um, the device that the, the that is used in this uh, blockchain to hold the Bitcoin. So I won't deal in cryptocurrency at this moment because I feel it's not it's not um, safe enough um, if you lose the information that you need to access your um, cryptocurrency. But similarly, the same happens with the blockchain database. Uh, if you have information that you uh, use uh, in another way or method other than cryptocurrency, that information, if it's not safeguarded and you don't have a backup of that information, then that information can be lost. Okay, smart contracts. Now, I've got two explanations here for smart contracts because I was looking at um, how they explain it. And it is now the smart contract is basically that cryptocurrency that you've bought you've bought that is in that blockchain so as you can see it's automated and you or when you transfer money from from when somebody's buying money you transfer some of your bitcoin for instance to or or, uh, or information to the next person then that be becomes their property and, and and you don't have that property anymore and and there's no intervention from any intermediary or third party and you can see it in the second explanation as well because um, the information is in a, in, a, in a central public database but which is obviously protected and you can see there it's running computer code and it cannot be changed so that is the risk of, of, of smart contracts so I, I haven't dealt with smart contracts as yet and if the way I see smart contracts it can be good in one sense but it's bad in another sense depending on how it is structured especially in a blockchain I think with cryptocurrency they made sure that you can't actually see a uh, um, person's name but I believe that smart contracts in blockchains can be set up in such a manner that it that you can can possibly um, access um, information if you have lost it but that is, I haven't heard of this system being used so much in normal contracting or doc, um, information, but mostly in um, uh, cryptocurrency that, that, that I've seen. Great. Yeah, you can see where some people do use some smart contracts, trade finance, real estate, medical, elections, and insurance. These people, they sign these contracts and then where they um, record information of, 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 of uh, the clients. Now, medical, with the smart contracts, they use um, scripts and uh, getting uh, signing information. Now, this comes to where I said, uh, uh, writing to the previous slide on the block, uh, blockchain with uh, uh, regard to cryptocurrency. Yeah, with this smart contract, the person's information um, is known so they actually can access the information. So this is, these are some of the examples that obviously are using these um, smart contracts. Now trade finance, I would reckon that will be inter, inter, uh, intergovernmental, in, intercontinental um, and outside South Africa dealing with maybe um, uh, America or Russia or India or whoever then they most probably will consider these smart contracts because it's convenient. I know with the medical, um, the, the, most of the doctors, doctors and institutions have gone um, electronic and that's why they use the medical uh, contracts and, and, and so forth. Even uh, discovery, I know for instance, you will send them your information and your request for your uh, 
maybe you pre prescribe minimum, minimum prescription uh, medication and so forth, then they will actually send the documents through and then they will send documents to you and you uh, they make agreements with you that, that way. Elections, this is a one-way thing where electronic um, voting is, is taking place uh, where a person will actually uh, vote and then it will go through. The problem I have with with that type of method is that the way it's set up, you can actually uh, manipulate uh, elections. I don't think uh, election um, in smart contracts is a good idea. Maybe I'm wrong. And insurance, that you see every day. There are some of you that deal with insurance that will know about insurance contracts. I mean, you you get a phone call. They they uh, the company sells you insurance. You agree. They keep the recording, and then uh, they then they they consider it as an agreement because you've agreed to the terms and conditions. Great. That concludes the lecture on uh, on this subject.